So I'd like to welcome Chancity Daniels, Stephanie Kendrigan, Lee Thomas, and Chandra Harris to lead a very innovative discussion on fostering female leadership. Welcome, ladies. Let's give them a wonderful round of applause. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the Women Who Lead event. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you uh, attended the event last year? Okay. So for a lot of you, it's a new experience, and I think that you will definitely be in for a treat today. Also, by a show of hands, how many of you in the audience actively uh, think about and engage in activities and events that enhance and advance your career? Okay, so a lot more hands, and just by you being here today, uh, tells me that that is true. Um, I'm excited for you to hear from our panel today, a group of uh, distinguished uh, panelists in their professions, in their uh, leaders in their hometowns, in the region, and in the state. And so before we jump into questions, I just want to take a moment for us to introduce ourselves and the many hats that we wear. Um, we'll start with um, our panelists to my left. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here in Macon with so many familiar faces and friends here today. I'm Chandra Harris, and I have the honor of serving currently as State Director for Senator John Ossoff. I've been serving in that role for the past three years, leading our team, our offices, and our operations across the state with team members in Columbus, Augusta, Savannah, Athens, and Atlanta, where I'm based. Um, I live there in Atlanta with my husband, my daughter, and our lovely little dog, Sammy. Um, and prior to just being a part of Senator Ossoff's team, I've worked with many members of this panel um, and several of you in the audience, um, formerly in my role as district director for Congressman David Scott for quite a bit of time. So that's a little bit of my professional um, and personal background to date. Good morning. Uh, I'm Lee Thomas, and I'm the director of the Georgia Film Office. Uh, we are a state agency, uh, part of the Department of Economic Development that houses tourism and international trade and global commerce and all that, but we are a very small piece of that puzzle, a uh, six-person office, and we are charged with bringing film and television projects to the state and the infrastructure that supports them. So I've been at that office for quite a long time, since 1996. So things are, things are going well right now. Uh, we've had a good uh, run up in the film business, as you've probably seen. Um, but I have been there for quite a long time. And I am Stephanie Kendrigan. I am the Vice President of Government Affairs, or I'm sorry, External Affairs for United Health Group. Um, I will also go ahead and plug, because I do this every single time. I'm also the chair of the Georgia Chambers PAC. So if any of you want to get involved politically, that's a great place to do it. Um, I have been with United Health Group for about two years. I cover Georgia and Alabama. Um, I have extensive history uh, lobbying in the state of Georgia. That's my entire background. Um, actually worked with uh, former Representative uh, Stephanie Benfield, or, or Stucky Benfield, when she was down at the Capitol. Um, but I've worked for a wide array of companies here in Georgia, including Delta Airlines. I work for a pipeline company. Um, I also we worked for the Georgia Department of Transportation at one point in my career. So I've been all over the place, but I've always been down at the state capitol. Thank you. And I am Chancity Daniels. I will serve as your moderator today. Uh, I am the Director of Talent Management at Flowers Foods. Um, you may be familiar with our brands, uh, Dave's Killer Bread, Tasty Cakes, uh, Wonder Bread, and uh, Nature's Own. I lead the learning and development team there where I am responsible for uh, the learning and development from hire through retire for our 16,000 employees. Actually, I've been at Flowers for six years and when I started, they did not have a learning and development um, function. I saw an opportunity and developed, built, and now lead that team. So uh, without further ado, we will get into some questions. Chandra. Um, can you speak to uh, what barriers do women still face in reaching leadership positions, especially in the governmental space? 
Sure, I've um, been working in that space now almost two decades, so got a little perspective. Um, I think naturally when we think about government, we're often thinking about the figures, the elected leaders we see, um, and undoubtedly I think just about a third of elected leaders in state legislatures and Congress are women, so there's definitely room for growth there um, to kind of match our, our population. But I think some common barriers for women to rise in the government space, sometimes it's fear. Um, certainly there's a lot of scrutiny that comes with serving in government. Um, there's also at times, I think, um, sacrificing time. There's a lot of work that comes with working in the government and public space. I think also um, maybe the unknown of not seeing yourself or seeing a place for your voice and perspective to resonate in government um, are also barriers that I think are common. And then another I think is limited networks. Um, I didn't grow up with the intention of being a congressional staffer, didn't even know the opportunities existed, went to college thinking I was gonna become a doctor, switched gears completely, went into public policy um, after some exposure, some internship opportunities, and I've, I've been encouraged by the growth I've seen over my career with more women in senior leadership roles. I'm one of two female state directors um, for our senators here in Georgia. Um, I can count a number of mayors, our lieutenant governor, and a host of other government offices that are currently led by women. So there's a lot of growth that's happened in recent years. I'm encouraged by that. I think that more women, as more women rise in these positions, it's creating a pipeline for talent for women who might be on the sideline interested in these roles to see a place for themselves in these positions and to hopefully um, take that leap of faith. It is a lot of work, but it's a very rewarding space to be in. Thank you. If you heard her, um, one of the things that stood out was she didn't know that that opportunity existed. So as you think about your career, there are so many opportunities that you may not even think exist right now. So keep that in mind. Thank you so much. Lee, uh, since you've been at the Georgia Film Office for more than two decades, uh, can you share any changes that you've seen regarding female representation? And in your opinion, is it getting better? Well, a little, well, sometimes, I guess. Um, I can give you, I'm gonna give you some stats, and I, I, I still think they're kind of depressing, but, um, so in 2023, women comprised 22% of directors, writers, producers, executive producers, editors, and cinematographers working on the top 250 grossing films. And it represents a decline of 2% since 2022. And it has risen only 5% since 1998. So that's, that's not great. Um, by role, women make up 16% of all directors, 17% of writers, 26% of producers, 24% of executive producers, 21% of editors, and 7% of cinematographers. So on films with male directors, women accounted for 9% of writers, 18% of editors, 7% of uh, cinematographers, and 11% of composers. But with, if you had just one woman director um, on the project, the numbers definitely change. So on films with at least one woman director, women comprise 61% of writers versus 9% if they'd had a male director. 35% of editors versus 18%, 10% of cinematographers, that's versus seven, and 26% 26% of composers. So I think, you know, it's, it's incumbent on us to, you know, make sure that we're mindful of giving opportunities to women when we can I know, um, you know, when governors change, usually uh, the person that is my boss, who is the head of economic development, that's like one of the first people to go. So, um, you know, Governor uh, Purdue put in place, he had somebody leave and he put in place the first female and only female director of the Georgia Department of Economic Development, Heidi Green. And we knew she would only be there 159 days because the governor was gonna change then. So she put me in place and I, was, I have been the only female director of the Georgia Film Office since its inception in 1973. And maybe she thought, you know, how bad could it be if I go off a cliff, she'll be gone. So, <laughs> but it's great. I mean, she gave me the opportunity and um, our office is 83% women. And <laughs> so um, we don't get to hire much because we only have a six person office, but I am, I 
do try to be very cognizant when we're employing people, not only women, but anybody underrepresented to make sure that you're including them in the conversation and looking at all the candidates. Thank you, Lee. Um, and a key takeaway there is creating space and opportunity uh, for other women and underrepresented um, individuals. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie, um, how have you built uh, your confidence and or resiliency over your career? Great question. Um, so I think, listen, I, I will say this one thing about politics um, and especially being a lobbyist and I had really good advice early on in my career that nobody ever bats a thousand in the legislature. There are going to be some years where you knock it out of the park and pardon the language, there's going to be some day years where you get your ass handed to you, right? You just never know what you're going to get at the state capitol. And, you know, really what you need to do is you got to think of it in terms of baseball. As long as you're batting, you know, 300, you're doing great in your career. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, one of the things that I always try and do every single year after I finish a legislative session is I go back and I look at everything that I did mm -hmm. and did I actually, did I give everything that I could on an issue or did I leave resources on the table you know cards that I could have played that I didn't um, and so it's this constant self-evaluation of how can I improve myself for next year I've been lobbying now for almost 20 years and I learned something brand new every legislative session right but you can't beat yourself up over it you have to take that life lesson and then just apply it to the next session and there's some times where you know, I get a little frustrated with myself because I have to relearn a lesson, right? I mean, there's things that I learned very early on in my career that sometimes even now they're like, you know, I'll slip up and make that same mistake again. And you're like, Stephanie, you knew better than that, right? So I think it's the constant self-reflection on how can I better myself? What lessons, even in defeat, can I take away from this? And how can I apply that to the next year? Because you always get a second chance at it, right? That's right. Thank you. So key takeaways there, um, continuously asking yourself, how can I improve? Um, continuously learning, uh, you never stop learning. That's the space that I live in and there's opportunities to learn and grow each and every day. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Chandra, what strategies have you found uh, e effective in balancing the demands of the government leadership with personal and family responsibilities. I will say it's, it's not easy and there's no magic solution or magic pill. I find like um, if there is out there, um, please share that with me. But um, it's a constant struggle. I find that being organized, um, having some good systems really help to um, kind of prioritize issues for me both professionally and personally. Um, I encourage everyone in this room to adopt and implement and really stick to systems where your your schedules are organized, you're on top of um, your priorities and tasks that come your way. I also have an incredible support system, um, some of that by blood, some of that you know by marriage, and some of that by choice, like friends who've come into my life and have um, been incredibly supportive professionally and personally. I think um, from a professional standpoint, I try to empower my team members um, so that they can step up and stand in the gap and rise to the occasion regardless of what the task might be. There are never um, two days that are alike or identical in probably anyone's workspace, but certainly I find in the U.S. Senate, um, we may expect a calendar to go one day at the beginning of the week and by midweek, it's kind of up in the air depending on what's happening across the country. And so being flexible, um, but also to the extent possible preparing in advance, um, putting some guardrails in place so that regardless of what change comes, um, we're able to adapt and pivot. And then I also think prioritizing um, that personal time for self and for family and you know being fully present in that space as well. It helps to balance um, and not you know, be consumed with work 24 seven, because it can definitely do that. But I think it's incredibly important to recharge, um, however you recharge, so that you can give yourself fully to those things that matter to you personally and professionally. Thank you. Um, 
how many of you, uh, by a show of hands, uh, work from home? So Flowers transitioned to work from home um, during COVID, and a lot of our positions are still work from home. And uh, I will share one of the things that I have struggled with is balance. Uh, because working from home, you, you literally are at home and work all day. Um, and I do see someone in the audience that um, did say to me, please stop sending emails at midnight. <laughs> uh, actually, I did send an email last night at midnight. Um, but balance is one of those things that I think as uh, professionals uh, that we really need to prioritize, as Chandra said, um, and find ways to incorporate self-care every single day. Uh, don't wait until just a special time, but every single day, whether it's um, morning meditation or a, a midday walk, um, and you know you will reap the benefits because whenever you know you've heard the saying, put on your mask first, uh, take care of yourself, or you won't be able to take care of anyone else. So thank you for that. Uh, Stephanie, uh, what role do ma male and female, because I do see some males in the audience, so th those male allies. Yes, let's give them a, a round of applause. All right, so uh, what role do male and female allies play in fostering female leadership, and how can they be actively engaged in this effort? So I have been incredibly blessed throughout my career to have some great um, male role models and mentors. Um, I will tell you, when I uh, was in my undergrad, I went to Georgia Tech, and no one ever grows up thinking that they're going to be a lobbyist, right? You have no aspirations. We are the pariah of society. <laughs> Nobody likes us, right? We're greedy, bloodthirsty, all of these bad things. Um, so obviously did not want to do that. I wanted to be a dermatologist, so I was a biology major. <laughs> And at Georgia Tech, there were no, like, gimme electives, right? There was no basket weaving, anything like that. So to fill my free electives, I had to take a state and local government class. And it just so happened that the professor for that course was also the lobbyist for Georgia Tech at the Capitol. So he would teach this course in the fall, and in the spring, he would shift all of his efforts to the Capitol to, to lobby on behalf of appropriations for, you know, campus outlays, that sort of thing. Um, but just a great, a great guy named Andrew Harris. And at the end of the semester, he said, Stephanie, I want you to go do this internship at the state capitol. You have a love for politics, and I think you should just go do it. Just see what it's like. And I'm like, I'm going to med school. They don't want me. They don't want a biology major working at the capitol. And he's like, well, trust me. I'll, I'll see what we can do. So the next year, I go and intern at the capitol, and I call my father, and I go, Dad, I am not going to med school. I'm going to be a lobbyist. <laughs> He was like, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> and I was like, I don't care, I'm doing it. So Andrew not only helped me get a great committee, he then became my advisor as I applied for master's programs. And I ended up at the University of Georgia, which is where he had also gone for his master's program. So throughout life, he was just, hey, Stephanie, try this next. This is what I would do next. He helped me get interviews. Um, he helped me get actually the interview that, I, that landed me my next full-time job. Um, and then once I was there, I got another great mentor. His name was Pete Robinson. And throughout my career, he was one of these individuals that I could call and get advice from mm -hmm. no matter what. And so I was so blessed to have um, these men who were my allies and really helped get me into my career. And I owe a lot to those gentlemen. Um, so men, you do play a very important role in helping foster women um, their, their career. The one thing I will say, and this is actually very interesting, I've had one female boss, and it was very frustrating for me because when I got hired, I was so excited that I'm about to have a female boss. This is awesome. You know, she, she cut her teeth in corporate America, and now she's, you know, there's so much for me to learn. And she was the opposite, right? And so what I would say for that is, you know, the, the way that she would talk to her employees was very demeaning. You know, I never felt inspired when I was going to work. And so I would also let that be a lesson to all of you that, you know, just because you're a female, you, you still have to, you have a role in empowering these young females and you have to take that role very, very seriously. Um, after that, you know, I kind of made a commitment to myself that anytime I have a chance 
to take a, a young you know, female, especially in politics, to coffee, lunch, I always say yes, right? It does not matter who you are. If you reach out to me and say, can you do coffee or, or lunch or whatever, I will absolutely say yes every single time. And I think that's how we empower other women, um, especially to get involved in politics. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that holds true for any business. Thank you. So what I heard you saying is both our male allies as well as each woman in this room, we all have a role to play in building that female leadership pipeline. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for anyone on the panel. Um, how can mentorship and sponsorship programs be structured to best support the advancement of women into leadership roles? I don't, you know, I don't know about mentorship programs, but I can, I can tell you there's some great opportunities here now that, that weren't around when I was, you know, coming up through, I went to UGA and then went to um, Georgia State, and speaking of, you know, disappointing your parents, um, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to position yourself for them to like film, I got my undergraduate in film, and then I, I said, I'm going to get my master's, and they're like, oh, no, film, and they, and I said, no, uh, Greek and Hellenic sculpture, <laughs> and so then they talked me back to film, so, you know, you start with the worst case scenario, and then you'll end up where you want to be, so, um, you know, there weren't many film programs then at, at, in Georgia, and there wasn't very much film. I mean, I went to NYU after that. I came back to Georgia, and I started at the state really because there weren't many opportunities. You know, it's there were a couple of crews out there uh, working on films. Um, it was very competitive. It, you know, we would do like maybe six or seven projects a year, so I thought the safer bet is to go work for the state. Um, you know, now coming out of the pandemic, we had 93 projects going at one time. So things have definitely changed for us. But there's something called the Georgia Film Academy, um, and it's a partnership between the University System of Georgia and the Technical College System. Um, you can go in through a state school. You can go in through a technical school. Um, you can also, like, if you didn't want to enroll at all, you can do continuing ed through, like, Chattahoochee Tech. Um, you, you know, the, all of the courses that you take take about six months. It's about uh, $1,500. And by the third course, you, you can be working on an internship being paid on maybe Stranger Things or on a Marvel movie or something like that, which certainly didn't exist when I was around. And, and they do, they are very conscientious about making sure that it is very equitable. The people that are let in, it's 50% women, 50% men. It's very uh, diverse uh, group, and it's, and it's a great way to fast track your way into the industry. So a lot more opportunities in Georgia than, than I think anywhere else. Thank you. And I'd add, I think similarly um, through internship programs with congressional offices and probably government offices across the board, um, offer incredible insight um, into all the different kind of job opportunities I alluded to earlier. So it's not you know, just the elected official that you see out front, but there are communications professionals, there are um, administrative professionals, there are policy experts. There's a wide range of people who help make our offices run, and so internships offer that insight to see visibility into the different teams that make our office flow, and you know, see if there might be a match with your skill sets or your interests, so I highly encourage um, people to seek out those kinds of opportunities if they're interested in learning more about government jobs. All right, thank you. Um, so Stephanie, I heard you um, say that any opportunity that you get to take um, a young female leader in, out to coffee, you take advantage of that. And so um, as you sit in your different perspective roles, think about that, whether you are a male ally or a female leader, um, you know, we all get very busy in our roles, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, you're thinking about all the things that you have on your to-do list, but take a moment to think about um, when you were just getting started in your career and how much it mattered and meant to you for someone to just take a moment to do a, you know, a 15 to 30 minute um, meet and greet uh, one of the things that I am responsible for at Flowers is um, from uh, the career pipeline, so from hire through retire, 
in everything that uh, someone needs to be successful in their role. Uh, so my team, we have created mentoring programs and sponsorship opportunities. And you know, even in companies, just uh, speaking to those of you who are responsible in your organizations for mentorship programs and sponsorship opportunities, um, you know, Flowers right now, we are going through major digital transformation, so everyone is extremely busy. But it's still important to make sure that our, uh, we're growing our pipeline of leaders. So modern mentoring looks very different than that one-to-one -one, uh, traditional mentoring um, program where one person is matched with another person and it's a continuous long-term relationship. Uh, modern mentoring can be one-to-many, so looking for experts in their field uh, to speak to many uh, people who need mentoring and, and there are great things that you can take away from that. And it may be, uh, you know, for a project, you know, you need mentoring because you have, uh, you need to develop a new skill. Um, so just keep that in mind and also, you know, for me, I've always looked for mentors. Uh, one of my mentors, when I first started in my career at Walt Disney World, um, lots of great female leaders there that took me under their wing, and I tell you that is something that I wanted to pay back um, to, over my career. And uh, one of the other things, Stephanie, that I heard you say is that you reflect on how well you did. Uh, one of the things that I reflect on, and I have a list of every mentor I've had and every leader that I've worked for and what I learned from them. And it is just uh, so powerful and impactful to go back uh, over that list and see the things that I've learned and the things that I've actually incorporated in my career. So I would encourage you to, um, self-reflection is so very powerful. So I just wanted to, to share that with you. Um, as we wrap up, I want to take a moment. We talked about balance. Chandra, you talked about um, balance. I would like for each of you to share some of the things that, um, in ways that you stay grounded and you take care of yourself. Because again, it is so very important to make sure that we have that balance and we're taking care of ourselves so we can uh, take care of those in our charge. Um, I think most people know I'm a pretty lighthearted person. Um, I'm pretty funny, I think. <laughs> um, my 15-year-old teenager keeps me pretty grounded, um, whether it's seeking her thoughts on what I'm wearing today or thoughts <laughs> on, I was telling someone yesterday how she's particularly interested in um, our, our federal national debt. So just the perspective, wide range of perspectives that I'm getting unfiltered from that teenager certainly keeps <clears throat> me um, grounded. I think also, um, you know, ha having a lot of responsibility in my role, but also um, not, I don't want to say not taking myself too seriously in that I can't mm -hmm. reflect on the perspective of the different members of my team at all levels, the people that we're dealing with, regardless of the walks of life that come through our doors, and just valuing that each person's bringing a unique perspective and some insight that lends to um, the decisions that we're making and considering on any given day. So I think between recognizing there's value in every voice and also um, having some own personal um, people in my life who keep me grounded, that's, that's how I stay grounded. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I realize I'm, I'm terrible at you know, staying away from the phone. Uh, you know, I play tennis, and between the first and uh, on the odd sets, you get to, you know, switch sides and drink water, which you definitely need. But instead of drinking the water, I will usually check my phone, and then I'll regret it, and I think I have a problem when I'm sitting out there about to die. <laughs> so um, I've gotten so I, I have tried to unplug a little bit, go to North Georgia to Rabin County, where we have a little cabin there, and has a really lousy signal. And it's my way of, um, you know, kind of involuntarily unplugging for a little bit. But um, I was actually joking with my, my table earlier that I don't know how work expected me to work yesterday when I had to do all of this Kate Middleton research. Um, <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> but, but there is a balance there, right? 
Um, you know, one thing I will talk about, and Chandra hit on this a little bit earlier, is, you know, I'm a working mom. And I think there's this misnomer sometimes that, you know, well, you're going to miss these things by being a working mom. And I would, um, I disagree wholeheartedly with that, right? I think that I am such a better mom because I work, right? Because when I get home in the evenings, I am so excited to see my children, right? <laughs> I love it when they come in the door, if I'm picking up from school, when they run to me. I love it, right? It's great. We, I still prioritize family dinners. I have made that, especially now that they're eating, you know, adult foods at this point. Um, you know, I'll, be, I'll make them like, everybody come into the kitchen. We are sitting down as a family to have, have dinner. And we do this thing where we talk about what was the best part of your day, what was the worst part of your day, right? But you have to, you have to say both. But it's a great way for me to connect with my kids. But it's, again, it's the balance, right? And you have to just, sometimes it's, you just have to schedule it, Right? Um, another thing that I'm big on is, you know, I work out every single morning, right? Now, I did it this morning. I did set an alarm, but it was a little bit too early, so I didn't do it. But, you know, that's a priority for me because, um, you know, it's a way for me to just go, like, throw a slam ball and take out all of that anger, you know, on that rather than a, a poor legislator who, you know, has no idea it's coming for him that day, right? Um, but it's important to find that balance. Thank you so much. Um, before we wrap up, do we have any questions from our audience? Okay, what is one over here? Um, I really appreciate your honesty with the balancing. Um, I have two young children, and I think one day I was dropping them off at carpool, and when they got out of the car, all this trash fell out of my car. And I was just like, what have I become? <laughs> I never thought that this would happen. And so, you know, I hear you all talking about scheduling and, you know, making sure you have these great resources. I feel like I am just really in the thick of it. And I'm like, I can't get out of this even if I am trying to schedule. So I guess you guys all look lovely and put together and calm and that is not how I feel on the inside so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, like what got you to that point to be like I am going to do this every day so listen I, I may be we may sit up here and like look nice right now but we even two weeks ago I had a I am a horrible mom moment and I'll tell you what it was it was, uh, I rarely check my Gmail. I'll check it once a day or something like that. But, of course, that's where all of the correspondence from teachers goes. So I totally forgot that my first grader had a field trip, right? So not only is she not wearing her elementary school T-shirt that Tuesday, I don't read the, the email until 11 a.m. that I was supposed to send her a sack lunch. And I'm standing on the third floor of the Capitol, and it had already been kind of a tough morning. And I felt the tears coming, right? That I have failed as a mother, that my kid is starving, right? <laughs> she's on this field trip at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens, and she's hungry. Like, right, her, her stomach is growling. Like, you can't even get this right as a mom. How dare you, right? And I went and I talked to one of my other mom friends. She's like, 70. Of course they're going to have extra sack lunches. It's Atlanta Public Schools. Of course they will, right? And I was like, you're right, you're right. I was like, she's probably so mad at me because my seven-year-old has a temper too, and she immediately <laughs> lets you know what she's thinking, right? And so my husband picked him up from school that day and brings him home, and she didn't say a word to me when she came in the door. And I was like, she, did. she didn't even know. And I quickly realized, she was like, oh, yeah, I had a sack lunch at school. She had no idea that I had dropped the ball, right? And it was, so what I would tell you, you are being too harsh on yourself, right? You are a great mom. Of course trash has fallen out of your, the back of your car because you've given them like all of these applesauce packets and suddenly grapes have turned into raisins, right? Don't worry about it, right? Focus on what you can control and being a great mom when you're with them and on being a provider and loving on them the rest will work out. It'll work out.
Yes, each and every day, give yourself <laughs> grace. Uh, you do deserve it. Uh, you know, we've all been there and you will go through different stages of your career and in life. So just remember, um, you're harder on yourself than anyone else will be. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello, my name is uh, Stephanie Quinones, um, and this is a two-parter. Uh, the first one is, um, I was a single mother with a travel um, soccer son. So the, the making the balance work, it can work. It's hectic, but it works. I live in Columbus, Georgia, and the team that my son played for was in Duluth. <laughs> That's two hours and 20 minutes if you're not aware. <laughs> um, and this is getting out of class school at four o'clock and going through Atlanta traffic. So it can be done. And I will tell you, my son is tw about to be 20 and he's very appreciative of it. And I used to have chicken nuggets in the car, so I get it. <laughs> um, the second thing is, um, I just recently, within the last year, took over a leadership position for our local chamber. And my question to you is, is how do you deal with conflict resolution? Um, <laughs> Um, as a woman in a leadership position of that nature that came into this position as a result of some stuff going on, uh, how do you deal with um, different personalities? I'll try. <laughs> I, think, um, I think personal issues certainly probably preoccupy a lot of managers' times. Um, you, you, Never quite know what's coming in uh, until it arrives there and how we're all coming from different backgrounds and we all have different perspectives and opinions and rearing and so that all can kind of come together and complement or sometimes it can, um, as you say, some stuff can develop there. Um, I think it's important to address things directly um, and early to try to nip things in the bud, so to speak. Um, and hear different perspectives. There's always side A, side B, the truth somewhere in the middle of that. Um, people don't always fully recount the situation. Um, I find that I've found that employees appreciate um, being heard, being their issues being quickly addressed. Um, they may not always get exactly what they were seeking out of it, but I've found over time, more often than not, that people appreciate being listened to and knowing that management takes concerns seriously um, and is devoting attention and, and making adjustments as needed, if appropriate. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I often tell people is that conflict is natural and necessary. Um, without conflict, things doesn't change. And just because there's conflict, there doesn't have to be confrontation. Um, one of the other things is Oftentimes we see symptoms, um, and so really understanding what's the root cause and getting to it. And so I think, Chandra, you're absolutely correct, um, you know, addressing it early because one of the things that I tell our managers is just because you choose not to confront it, it doesn't go away. It often gets worse. Okay. Any other questions for our audience, from our audience? Hi, uh, my name is Fozio, and I'm here with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. And my question is, to someone who's new to the field, especially in leadership, how does one deal with imposter syndrome, but also, if you could go back in time, what would you tell yourself, your young self, as you were entering? <laughs> That's right, girl, you, you've got this. Um, I think imposter syndrome is, not something that it's just um, for, for someone who's new in the career, new in the profession or field, I think at some point we may all suffer from imposter syndrome. One of the things is, you know, just giving yourself grace, um, taking the opportunity to learn. Um, if you see someone doing the things that you want to do and someone that you admire, don't be afraid to go to them and um, ask for you know, 10, 15 minutes of their time, take them to, offer to take them to coffee. Um, you know, women, men who are professionals, they 
oftentimes love giving back. And so surrounding yourself with a village of people who uh, want to pour into you and just continue to learn and grow, as uh, Stephanie said earlier. Anyone else on the panel want to? I would say um, give yourself grace. Like if I were looking back at the beginning of my career at 21, I think there's often this, um, this feeling of measuring yourself against others or measuring yourself against where you thought you'd be in your career. That can be early 20s, that can be 30s, 40s, what have you. But giving yourself grace, um, embracing your own unique life's journey. Um, I think the blessing of life is so incredible. I think each opportunity each day is such an amazing experience um, to be with people um, also experiencing this journey as humans. And I think that we should just embrace the blessing of life, but also give ourselves grace. You know, I would tell my 20 something year old self that. Thank you. Um, there's some questions over in the back. Okay, well, I'm getting the, let's wrap this up. Um, so I hope that you all um, found this panel to be valuable and impactful. And regardless of where you are in your career, whether you are uh, new to, to your career, uh, mid-career, or seasoned leaders, that uh, you heard something today that you will take uh, back with you and help to continue to build and cultivate and advance the uh, female leadership pipeline. Thank you, sir, very much, and we enjoyed our time today.